Good morning, brothers and sisters. This quarter, we're considering the person of Jesus Christ. We're asking him to cleanse us of love for the world, to remove any idols, and to increase our love for him. When we think of Christ, most often we think of Savior, Redeemer, Good Shepherd, Lord. Not often we think of him as our priest. And perhaps that's because in our minds, we associate the priesthood with the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament. We are not Israelites. Uh, we no longer need the animal sacrifices. Jesus has fulfilled the Old Covenant. He has made a new covenant with his people. So the priesthood isn't for us. Or perhaps you associate the priesthood with certain practices, such as uh, confession or administering the sacraments. A priest is someone who is called father, but we have only one father who is in heaven. There is no special class of priests in the new covenant, but every believer is chosen as a priest. And this is something which is known as the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers. We see that in 1 Peter chapter 2. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In the Old Testament, there were places in the temple that only the priests could go. But in Christ, every believer has access to the Father. Every believer can pray directly to God. We can confess our sins to one another, both to God and to each other, as we read in James 5.16. Every Christian proclaims the good news of Christ, not only a select few. And every Christian is called to offer sacrifices. Every Christian is called to offer sacrifices. Perhaps that surprises you. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Every Christian sacrifices directly to God, but our sacrifice is not animals or sacraments. When we take communion, there is nothing in the wafer, nothing in the hands which offer the juice, which impart any special power. Psalm 51 verse 16 says, For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. Lives of worship and holiness. These are the sacrifices which each of us as believers in Jesus Christ offers to God the Father. These are the sacrifices we offer, but we do so imperfectly. And if we survey the history of the priesthood, that's largely what we see, failure after failure. For example, while Moses was still on Sinai receiving God's commandments, Aaron relented to the will of the people and he made the golden calf so that they would have a God like the other gods or like the other nations. And this was the man who was soon to become the first high priest. The, the priesthood was not off to a very good start. In Leviticus 10.1, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, in disobedience to God, 
offered strange fire, and the Lord was displeased. And fire from the presence of the Lord consumed them, and they perished. In Numbers 16, a Levite by the name of Korah led others in rebellion against Moses and Aaron. They said, Moses, Aaron, who are you? Are we not Levites also? And they sought the priesthood for themselves. When God sent judgment upon Korah and the men he was leading in rebellion, uh, the earth swallowed them up. And the people, they actually blamed Moses and Aaron for the death of the rebels, saying, you are the ones who have caused the death of the Lord's people. So already there was jockeying for position, seeking to usurp the priesthood. Again, it was off to a rocky start, and it didn't get much better. The sons of Eli, the priest, Hophni and Phinehas, though priests, 1 Samuel chapter 2 tells us, were worthless men. They were consumed by greed and by their appetites. When men would come to offer sacrifice, Hophni and Phinehas would demand that they give them meat to eat, even before the offerings had been made. And if the offerers refused, they would threaten them with force. Imagine that they would threaten to take by force the meat which was intended as an offering to the Lord. While King David lay dying, Adonijah sought to usurp the throne from Solomon, and he was supported by Abiathar, the priest. Throughout the history of the priesthood, the priests not only failed in their duty to teach the law to the people, they themselves turned away from it, and they allowed idolatry to invade the land, even into the temple itself. In Hosea chapter 4, we read this, Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land, because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priests. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. The more they multiplied, the more they send against me, speaking of the priests, I will change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people and direct their desire toward their iniquity. And it will be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds because they have stopped giving heed to the Lord." The greater the power of the priests became, the more they sinned. They should have been calling the people to repentance, but instead they led them away from God and into greater and greater sin. As a result, Israel and Judah were carried away into exile in 586 BC by the Babylonians. The temple was destroyed by the armies of the Babylonians and then later again by the Romans, as we see here. The prophet Ezekiel was among those exiles to Babylon when God gave him a vision of the idolatry and the corruption which gripped the temple before it was destroyed by the Babylonians. So this is what Ezekiel saw, and this is the reality of what the temple had become and what the priesthood had become before Jerusalem was taken by the Babylonians and the temple was destroyed. Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 10, So I entered and looked, and behold, every form of creeping things and beasts and detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the wall all around. Then he said to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the dark, each man in the room of his carved images. 
For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. And he said to me, yet you will see still greater abominations, which they are committing. Imagine the elders and the priests are committing idolatry in their rooms and in the secret, in the dark. But the Lord says to Ezekiel, you will see yet greater abominations. Verse 14, then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz, weeping for Tammuz. The Babylonians observed a seasonal calendar of mythology. In their mythology, the god Tammuz was a god of fertility. And Tammuz died each year early in the fall when vegetation began to wither. He would revive in the spring when the plants began to bloom together with the fertility of the land. And this renewal of fertility would be celebrated with with festivals full of gross sexual immorality. So when, when Tammuz would die in the fall before the winter, they would weep for the death of Tammuz and then they would celebrate his, his resurrection each spring. And here in the temple, women are sitting weeping for Tammuz, a Babylonian false god. He said to me, do you see this, son of man? Yet you will see still greater abominations than these. Imagine blatant worship of idols and false gods in the temple. Yet he says, you will see still greater abominations than these. Verse 16, then he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the entrance to the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were prostrating themselves toward the sun. Uh, this is believed, these 25 men believed to represent 24 priests together with the high priest prostrating themselves, worshiping the sun. Imagine the priests themselves defiling the court's inner temple with the worship of idols and of the sun. So Israel was taken into exile in Assyria, in Babylon. The temple was destroyed. Even after Judah's return from exile, the priesthood immediately descended again into corruption and into the same evil as before. Malachi chapter 2. And now this commandment is for you, O priests. If you do not listen, and if you do not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. And indeed, I have cursed them already because you are not taking it to heart. For the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But as for you, you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by the instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So again, even after the exile, the priesthood immediately is returning to evil. And they are causing people to stumble and actually turning them away from the Lord. By the time of the Roman occupation, the high priest no longer even came from the priestly line. They were political appointees of Rome. They were only concerned with their own position, with their own wealth, and with their influence. Names such as Annas and Caiaphas are familiar to us. Men given to bribery, to deceit. Men who put to death God's very Son. This is what the priesthood had become. Jesus said in, in his day, Matthew chapter 23, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, 
hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, one follower, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Imagine the priests not leading people to the word of God, to the law of God, not leading them to God at all, leading them to hell. Verse 23, verse 33, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Mankind's entire history is one of depravity, of failure. Even the priests who were supposed to be a light, they failed again and again. They were evil. They were totally corrupt. And this is why Jesus came. He came to lift up a, a holy nation of priests chosen by God to be rescued from darkness and to make them a light to the nations. The light which Israel was supposed to have been and which failed to be, and yet which one day they will be again. Christ became flesh, the perfect man, human and divine. He became the perfect Passover lamb, put to death, crucified for our sins. He also became our perfect and our great high priest. He became our high priest. And while the priesthood has been a succession of one failure and one disappointment after another, those who put their trust in Christ, our great high priest, they will never be disappointed. When we consider this background of the failure of the priesthood, uh, it's total depravity and it's total corruption. It gives us new appreciation for Jesus' role as priest. And Jesus' role as high priest is presented most clearly in the book of Hebrews. Just a very brief introduction to the book of Hebrews. One, one author has put it this way. The book of Hebrews was written by a Hebrew to other Hebrews, telling the Hebrews to stop acting like Hebrews. Uh, many early Jewish Christians were slipping back into the practices of Judaism in order to escape persecution against Christians. And this letter is an exhortation to them. It's an exhortation to persecuted Christians to continue in the grace of Jesus Christ and that exhortation to continue in the faith to persevere it is connected with the truth that Jesus is our high priest so what I want to do I want to just uh, paint with some broad strokes what Hebrews says about Jesus our high priest and then we'll end We'll conclude with the key passage from our scripture reading. So some, some qualities of our high priest in the book of Hebrews. First of all, he is compassionate. He is a compassionate high priest. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father. For which reason he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brethren. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Verse 16. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest 
in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. When Jesus himself took on flesh by becoming a man, he did so, yes, so that he could taste death for us on the cross, but there were also other reasons. He, he came in the flesh to fulfill the promise of God to Abraham in Genesis 12, verse 3, that in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He came in the flesh to fulfill the promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, of a seed of mankind who would crush the head of Satan. But by becoming a man, Jesus became our Savior, that's true, but he also became our brother. He became our Savior and he became our brother. He knew what it, what it was like to be hungry. Uh, he knew what it was like to suffer. He understood temptation because he himself was tempted. In Hebrews 5, we read, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is taken from among men and appointed as high priest. Why? So that, verse 2, he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. The ignorant and the misguided. I don't know about you, but this accurately describes me. I'm ignorant. I'm misguided. And I need a gentle and a compassionate uh, savior, but also a gentle and compassionate high priest who can deal gently with me because he, he, he too was beset with weakness. No angel or spirit could serve as high priest. Only, only one who had experienced the weakness of men. Jesus knew physical weakness, but he never gave up. He experienced the full force, the full weight of temptation, but without sin. So certainly he understands the temptations that we face. It's why Paul is able to say in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Jesus knows what a man can bear because he bore it. When you are weak, look to Jesus. When you are tempted, look to Jesus. He's not a brutal tyrant. He's not a, a distant and disinterested God. In his humanity, he is like you and me. He cares. He's compassionate. He knows our needs. Hebrews 5, 7 says, In the days of his flesh he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Christ knows your pain. He knows the burdens that you carry because he bore them too. Cry out to him. He is a merciful and a compassionate high priest. We also see in the book of Hebrews that he is a high priest who is appointed by God. He's appointed by God. Uh, recall how the priest struggled for power, and there were many usurpers of the priesthood. Remember how Korah rebelled and wished to appoint himself as priest. Uzziah the king usurp the priesthood. 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16. But when Uzziah became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly, and he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. For he entered the temple of the Lord 
to burn incense on the altar of incense. He usurped the priestly role. In the time of Christ, the, the priests, the high priests, were simply uh, political appointees of Rome, appointed for corrupt purposes. Not so with Christ. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest. But he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you, being designated by God as a high priest. Many priests, many of the high priests were unqualified to serve. Today there are self-made pastors who are unqualified to serve. They do it for the position, for the reputation, for the honor. Unlike them, however, Jesus did not assume the office of high priest for his own glory, but he was called and appointed by God. For anyone else to become high priest, that's exaltation. For Christ, that was humiliation. So we trust him because we know that there is no wrong motive there, that Christ is seeking his own glory. No, yes, God glorifies himself, but Christ became high priest out of humiliation, out of submission to the Father. So we know there's no impure motive. There's only love. He is compassionate. He is humble. He's appointed by God. Also, we learn that he is a perfect high priest. He's perfect. Hebrews 7, 26. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. He does not need daily to make offering for himself and for the sins of the people, because he's done it once for all. He's perfect. The Day of Atonement was the holiest day of the year for the nation of Israel. Daily sacrifices were made in the temple for the sins of the priests, for the sins of the people. But many sins remained of which they were unaware, simply weren't aware of them, or for which sacrifice had not been, had been, had not been offered. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would would perform elaborate ceremonies. He would first wash in the basin in the courtyard. He would offer the bull as a sin offering for himself. And then he would enter, here's the, the priest, offering the bull as a sin offering for himself. Then he would enter the holy place with the blood of the bull and with the incense. It would look something like this. He would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat seven times. He would sprinkle it upward and then he would sprinkle it downward. He then exited and offered a goat for the sins of the people, re-entered the holy place and the holy of holies to sprinkle blood again on the mercy seat and again on the curtain, on the veil as he left. He then returned to the altar of burnt offering and cleansed it with the blood of the bull and the goat. He would remove his special garments, wash again, he would bathe, and then he would redress and offer two rams as burnt offering for himself and for the people. And this is just a portion of what the high priest would perform on the Day of Atonement, maybe only about half. So many elaborate procedures just to be permitted 
to enter. Only the high priest could enter the holy place, the holy of holies, once a year. And only on the Day of Atonement and only after going through all of these cleansings and all of these sacrifices, first for himself, before he could even offer sacrifice for the sins of the people. Jesus had no need as the sons of Aaron to offer sacrifice for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because he's perfect. He had, he has no sin. Hebrews 7, 28, for the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son made perfect forever. Our high priest is compassionate. He's humble, appointed by God, and he is perfect. Fourth, he offered the perfect sacrifice. He offered the perfect sacrifice, chapter 10. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, what did he do? He sat down at the right hand of God. See, the priests, when they perform their service in the temple, they're always standing. But when Jesus, when he was done with his work, he sat down to signify that his work was done. Verse Verse 13 of chapter 9, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? An imperfect priest offering an imperfect sacrifice doesn't give us any hope, does it? But rather a painful reminder daily, year after year, of the continual presence of sin and of the futility of man's efforts under the law. But by, his, by offering his own blood once for all, Jesus gives hope. He gives us complete confidence that his work is finished. It is done. So he is perfect. And he offered the perfect sacrifice. He is the perfect high priest. And he is the perfect lamb of God. And then fifth, he is eternal. He is an eternal high priest. Hebrews 7, 23. The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were present, prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. There were many priests who each in turn performed their duties at best imperfectly, often, often with much evil and corruption. One after another, they served and then they died and were replaced. But Jesus is an eternal priesthood because he is eternal. He lives forever. We don't have to worry who's going to be the next high priest, like we often wonder who will be the next president. We don't have to concern ourselves with that. We don't have to fear the future because we know that day after day, year after year, forever, our high priest lives. He is eternal. He is in heaven. Hebrews chapter 8. Now the main point and what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not men. 
Jesus' service is better than all of the other priests, than the Aaronic, the Levitical priest, because he sits in a better sanctuary. The Old Covenant, as you remember, was only a shadow of the New. In the same way, the Old Testament temple and the holy place, despite their grandeur, despite their beauty, they were only, a, they were only meant as a shadow of heaven where God is and where Christ is, our high priest. Uh, when your wife is standing in front of you, wh what will you tell her? Will you tell her, uh, ang ganda ng anino mo? Uh, no, of course not, because she's standing there and she is beautiful. The priests, they performed their earthly service in an earthly sanctuary, which was a mere shadow of heaven, a mere model of heaven. But Jesus performs his perfect ministry in heaven itself at the right hand of God. And this is why, this is why the Apostle John was able to write in 1 John chapter 2, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Our advocate is there in heaven on his throne, seated at the right hand of the Father. And he advocates for us and makes intercession for us. We have a great high priest. He is compassionate. He is humble. He is perfect. He offered the perfect sacrifice of himself. He lives forever. He is eternal. And he is seated at the right hand of God. We have a great high priest. And what's the conclusion? What's the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is found in Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since or because we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, therefore, because we have this great and wonderful high priest, Jesus, a perfect high priest who has completed his perfect work, who, is, who has passed through the heavens and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Therefore, let us hold fast our confession. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God's throne is a throne of grace. There we find mercy through the intercession, through the advocacy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who intercedes on our behalf to the Father, who clothes us in his righteousness. And the writer of Hebrews, he encourages these Christians who are undergoing persecution not to fall away from the faith, not to compromise with the world, but to hold fast their confession. And as they hold fast that confession, because of the confidence that they have in this wonderful and perfect eternal high priest, they can draw near to the throne of grace, to receive mercy, to receive grace in our time of need. So we have a great high priest. And what's the conclusion? Hold fast your confession and draw near in Christ to the throne of grace where you can find mercy in your time of need. Like Jesus, we are tempted. Like Jesus, at times we're persecuted or we suffer. Temptation will either lead you away from God or it will draw you and drive you toward him for help and to receive mercy. Trials will either lead you away from God or they will turn you back to God to receive mercy and help. You know, for thousands of years, the priesthood has been a disappointment. It was a failure, just as mankind is, has been a failure. 
Jesus came to redeem mankind, to choose us for salvation, but also everyone that Christ has chosen for salvation, he has chosen them to be a priest, a, a holy nation, a royal priesthood set apart for service to the Lord, where we offer to him the sacrifice of our lives, of holiness and of worship. And this is a tall task. We have, uh, we face temptation in the world around us. There is, there is pressure to abandon the principles of Scripture, to abandon the faith, and to compromise with the world. But we have a perfect high priest. He understands those pressures, those temptations. He understands our suffering. And he is there to offer help to us in our time of need. Every other priest at one time or another will disappoint. But our high priest, our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, he will never disappoint. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. A hope both sure and steadfast. One which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest. He is our anchor of the soul. Other verses tell us that those who put our hope in him will never be disappointed. So, brothers and sisters, uh, let us remember our great high priest. Let us love him more. And let us, in our time of need, Whatever the circumstance, whatever the temptation, uh, whatever the trial that we're facing, let us, through him, draw near to the throne of grace that we may find help in our time of need. Let, me, uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer and ask that he will help us to do this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is truly our great high priest. Lord, when we uh, compare him to... Uh, the priesthood of men. There is no comparison. Uh, Men will fail us again and again, but Christ will never disappoint. Uh, We thank you, Lord, that we have a high priest who has experienced the things that we have experienced, who has suffered and borne the things that we have suffered, who knows our weakness, and who comes to us, Lord, in our time of help, that we may find grace and mercy in our time of need. We thank you for him, that he is compassionate. We thank you, Lord, for the confidence that we can have in him, knowing that he is humble, that he loves us, knowing that he is eternal, that he is perfect, that he has uh, offered the perfect sacrifice for us. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. We thank you, Lord, that you live always to make intercession for us. Help us, Lord, not to trust in our own righteousness, but in your completed work. Help us, Lord, not to rely on our own strength, but in your perfect intercession on our behalf. And we look to you as our only help and our only salvation in our time of need. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.